Good evening, everyone. I am your host and instructor, Lainey Shaughnessy, and welcome to Spindle TV, your best source for CNC CAD CAM training videos. Spindle TV is brought to you by Digital Woodcarver, inspiring your creativity and providing you with the tools to create your own unique masterpieces. Hello, 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 hello. How's everyone doing tonight? Hope all you guys are doing well. We're going to be talking uh, tonight about uh, something that we all kind of uh, struggle with and we could all learn a little bit more about. Uh, what bit to choose for the job that we're doing and what is the proper settings for that bit uh, and the proper setup. RPMs, feed rate, you know, uh, step over, pass step, things like that. Um, you know, what would be... Uh, how would we set up our tool and our tool database and some of the things that we can do so we're going to be talking about things uh, like RPM settings uh, how fast that bit is spinning uh, we're going to talk about feed rate how fast that machine is moving that bit pushing and pulling it through the material we're also going to discuss chip load uh, this is going to be the first time you guys may have heard uh, the term chip load um, this is the optimal point where the bit is cutting and it's removing chips rather than making dust. Uh, those chips allow for uh, the heat to be expelled as those chips are get, flying away. That heat is dissipating with those chips, uh, pulling that heat away from your router bit. And uh, as we all know, or we may not know, but heat is what dulls uh, that router bit. Uh, so if we're making chips uh, rather than dust, sawdust, uh, those the, that that keeps that bit cooler uh, when it's running. So what is you know we're going to be discussing the optimal chip load uh, for different materials and all, and it's based on material thickness uh, and uh, you know the RPMs and in our bit settings and things uh, for the chip load. And so we're going to discuss that a little bit, but we're also going to be discussing the uh you know uh, how to choose what bit for what job we're doing you know we all struggle with that and there's uh some common things so uh with that being said that little brief explanation let's go ahead and jump over to the vetric software and we're going to start talking about uh before we get into the rpms and 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 the settings for the bit we're going to talk about uh the types of bits and um you know which bit to choose for which job all right so let's go ahead and uh, move over to the vetric software and here we go Okay, now my uh, stream looks a little funny, so let's see here if I zoom in. Okay, we can. Some of those lines look like they're missing uh, until I zoom in uh, properly and stuff. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what the deal is with that, but uh, if you're seeing missing lines on these items and stuff, uh, they're there. Uh, we just have to. We'll have to zoom in as we talk about these bits and things. Um, let's see if it helps if I change the uh, layer color not really okay so we'll go back to normal black and white all right so what are the uh, types of bits and uh, the you know cuts that we're looking for so one of the main things uh, that we want to uh, look at is what what is the job until am I doing a pocket cut? Okay, if I was doing a pocket cut where I was removing to material uh, to a specified depth uh, and cutting a pocket out and things such as a like a, dat a dado 
a groove, um, mortise, a you know a pocket itself, or you know maybe I'm cutting a dish or something or what have you, um, and I'm removing that material. Well, now we have to determine uh, what bit to use for that pocket cut. So if I want my pocket cut to have you know straight walls and a flat bottom then I'm going to choose a an end mill a straight bit uh, this could be a two flute straight bit it could be an up cut bit a down cut spiral bit you know if we're using the spiral bits and things and um, these bits are going to you know as they come down to create that flat bottom pocket cut and everything they're going to create that flat wall that straight wall because of the straight bit okay so if my cut that i'm doing uh requires that material being removed and I'm, I'm going to be you know wanting straight walls and a flat bottom i'm generally going to turn to a flat bottom bit uh, referred to as an end mill um, and this could be a straight uh, end mill which has two flutes and straight cutters down the side or it could be a spiral where the flutes uh, have a helical direction of uh, you know an up cut direction or a down cut up cut means that as that bit is removing material the chips are being thrown out of the cut uh, up and away now an up cut spiral bit has a tendency to cause chipping uh, you know on the edge of the bit it could cause you know chipping and that upward motion and stuff as it's pulling up it's also pulling that top part up you know creating chipping at the top and um, so if I'm doing a cut that I want a nice clean top surface uh, and, and everything uh, for maybe it's a joint like a dado or a rabbit or something then I'm typically going to use a down cut spiral because the down cut spiral is pushing those chips down uh, keeping them nice and smooth at the top of the cut um, rather than pulling them up you know chipping away at the veneer or the top surface and so uh, I just have to remember that um, you know depending on what I'm doing especially if I'm using plywood or something uh, if I'm using, sorry, my dog walked in. If I'm using plywood or something, then I'm definitely going to use a down cut spiral because I do not want the top surface of that veneer of that plywood to chip. So I'm going to use a down cut spiral. Now, if I'm doing a pocket cut and maybe I'm making a bowl or something like a chip and dip tray and things, and I'm using a bowl bit. Well, that bowl bit has a radius on the cutter. And so therefore, I'm going to get the straight wall because of the cutter itself. Uh, but as it gets to the bottom of the cut, the bottom of my pocket depth, uh, as it's cutting across, I'm going to end up with that radius, whatever the radius is of the router bit. Uh, so my radius of my bowl bit is going to determine the radius of that curve at the bottom of my cut and we generally want to do that for our bowls and trays and stuff so we have that nice transition from the side of the cut to the bottom of the bowl and all all right so uh, those radius bits those bowl bits now v carving if I'm going to be V cutting, and let's say that this is an example of a 60 degree V bit and everything, the I'm going to get that angled wall, that 60 degree angle cut, and uh, you know as I get that cut, and of course the block that I'm here is a little bit uh, bigger than my bit itself, you know, drawing it out, but um, I'm going to get that 60 degree angle cut. Now, if I were doing a straight V cut, then most likely the other side of my wall is let me get over to 60 the other side of my cut is going to have that v-shaped bottom okay so both walls on the left and the right side of the blade as it's cutting that v groove 
uh, I'm going to have that nice V cut angle. Now, there are times that when we're doing a V carved tool path that we have to set a flat depth. So what that does is depending on the depth of cut, the flat depth truncates the V and it cuts it off to a flat bottom. Okay, so whatever the depth of cut you specify. So as that uh, bit, you know, gets down to that depth, it's going to start to try to flatten off that cut and things. And so um, we have the option of letting the V bit do the flat depth, you know, flatten it out. So that little point is going to be trying to, uh, you know, flatten that area out and everything. Or we can use a straight bit um, to do the flat depth area. And let me size this more appropriately to my V bit. So my V bit would do all the V cutting. Um, of the the project on the sidewalls and around the letters and things it'll do all that nice V cutting giving them those angled walls and things uh, and then my straight bit my flat bit would do all the flat area clearance now if there's a particular area where my flat bit cannot fit because the diameter is too big then my V bit takes over and my V bit in those areas will do all the flat work in those areas where the diameter of the straight bit can't fit into. So when you are choosing, if you do set a flat depth and you're choosing to use a flat area clearance tool, your flat bit, you want to choose an appropriate diameter that will be able to get up close to those letters and things and and um, you know get those flat areas uh, but never fear if the bit is too big to fit in those areas the V bit the toolpath will create it so the V bit takes over and clears those areas out and flattens them out and the V bit does a decent job of flattening out the flat areas and all but it's that small tip is trying to flatten out that big pocket area and so therefore it creates a very long run time because there's a lot of stuff that that little bit has got to clear out and everything okay now uh, the same goes for if I was using a V bit that has a wider head uh, let's say a 90 degree V bit the only difference between the 60 degree and the 90 degree my cut depth and everything is going to be the same whether I'm using a uh, um, sorry my cut not that was incorrect statement um, my cut depth is not going to be the same my cut the look of my cut as far as my letters and everything at the top of the cut uh, will be the same but the depth of cut will vary due to the angle so a V carved tool path looks at the space between two lines and so let's say if we were looking at our V carve from a side view here and if I was using a 60 degree V bit let me find my 60 degree there it's going to calculate how neat how deep it needs to cut for that 60 degree V bit to for those two lines to meet at the bottom at a V card so the space between my two lines is going to determine the depth of cut and the bit that I'm using the angle of the cutter that I'm using is also going to determine the depth of cut so with a 60 degree V bit uh, if my lines are far apart, I'm going to get a deep cut. If they're close together, it's going to be a shallower cut. But if I was using a 90 degree V bit, let me get my 90 degree going on here. My 
my depth of cut is going to be shallower. If I'm using a 90 degree V-bit, my depth of cut on that same spacing and everything, my, my cut's gonna be shallower because it doesn't require that much depth for those two lines to meet at a V with a 90 degree V-bit. So why, you know whether we're using a one degree, 100 degree, 90 degree, 80 degree, whatever bit angle we're using, the design at the top of the cut, you know, our letters and things like that, that's going to look the same. The only thing that's going to vary is our depth of cut based on the angle of the bit we're using. So why would we, you know, what would be the purpose of or, or when would we use a 60 or a 90 or things like that? Well, if I'm cutting in a shallow board, and I'm doing a V carving, well, in order to V carve, it might cut through my material. And the software is going to warn me and say, hey, your material is only so thick, it's going to require this much depth of cut for the uh, for the v-carve and it's going to say use a waste board because you're cutting through the material well if i don't want to cut through the material i have two choices one i can use a wider angle v-bit and to create that shallower cut or i can set a flat depth and that flat depth will limit the depth of cut so any part of the v-carving it's not going to bring the whole design down to whatever flat depth that we set it's only the parts that would exceed normally that flat depth any of the parts of our carving that would exceed that flat depth it's going to limit to that depth so we end up with a cut that has our angled walls but we have a flat bottom, okay? So any part of the design that would have normally gone beyond the flat depth we set, it truncates that V, cuts it off, and it limits anything that's going to cut beyond that to that depth of cut, creating that flat bottom area. So we'll still have our angled walls, but then we're gonna have that flat bottom area. And that's why when we choose to use a flat depth in that VCarve toolpath, it gives us the option to use a flat area clearance tool. And we just wanna make sure that the radius of our flat area clearance tool can fit within the cut area. Because if the diameter of the cut, the tool, is too big to fit down on that flat depth then it's not going to create the tool path for that it's going to make the v-bit do all the flat work so hopefully you're able to understand that uh, and stuff so uh, you want to make sure that your flat area clearance tool uh, fits in to the uh, area you want to you know for the flat areas you want to or otherwise you're going to the v bits going to have to do that work so we are either um let me get rid of that so we are either you know setting a flat depth or we're letting it carve uh to whatever depth it you know it's going to carve to if we're cutting through and that's not what we want to do then we have the choice of using a wider angle v bit uh you know so it doesn't cut that deep now there are times where like i prefer using the 60 degree v bit because i like the definition of the depth you know i like the definition in the cut but there are times where you know it's going to cut through and i have to set a flat depth and i have that choice saying you know okay do i want to set a flat depth and or do i want that nice v-shaped look at the bottom of the cut well if it's going to cut through then I'm going to use a wider V bit, but I would prefer, uh, you know, to use, you know, a, a V bit so I have that V cut bottom rather than setting a flat depth. Um, but it all depends on what 
what you're going for you know i couldn't use my 60 degree v bit in this cut because the space between the lines is so wide um, that it's going to cut through the material but now if those lines were closer together then oops let me close that rectangle tool then I you know I would be able to uh, use my 60 degree V bit oops let's not do it that way let's continue straight down let me get to 60 and let me trim that up so if my lines were closer together then I could use my 60 degree V bit because you know it's not going to cut that deep but it's going to give more definition uh, versus if those close lines and everything if I was using my um, 90 degree V bit oops bear with me a second I jumped off my 45 there that 90 degree V bit is going to give me a shallower cut and sometimes depending on how close those lines together especially small fonts and things like that then the cuts going to be super shallow and I like a little bit more definition so I like you know I would tend to use my 60 degree V bit or even you know a 30 degree V bit 22 degree 22 and a half degree you know to get a little bit more depth and definition you know that narrower angle and stuff so um you know you would you know you would choose your your bit accordingly now someone asked a very good question um if somebody uh, uh if i ha if i do set that flat depth for that cut and everything if i do set my flat depth and i am using a flat area clearance tool would i use the flat area clearance tool first to do the cut or the v bit first to do the cut so nine times out of ten you watch when you create your v carve toolpath with flat depth if you look at your toolpath that it creates it creates the pocket cut first followed by the v carve because uh, you always want to run it's not required but you generally always want to run your pocket cut first because as that bit is coming and doing the flat depths and everything if there is any tear out uh, caused by the flat depth the V bit is going to clean that tear out up um, when it does the V carving when it comes and cleans up those nice angles so what will happen is and let's see if I can draw this out if I have my block of wood my end mill is going to do that first cut let me get my 90 degree going on here it's going to come and do that flat depth and everything and if I get any tear out up here in the uh, let's see if I can simulate this uh, cut the vector here and let's see if I can move that up so if I get any tear out at the top of the cut and stuff uh, let's see if I can uh, simulate this a little bit better. Bear with me a second. Terrible example of a drawing, but let's say that I get tear out and it, you know, chips on the edge and everything. Well, when my V bit comes. let me get my V bit drawn when my V bit comes it's going to come and it will be removing that edge you know that straight edge and bear with me a second let me extend this line out um, it's going to remove that tear out 
Uh, let's get this done and let's get this away. It's going to clean out. It's going to clean up that edge when it's doing that V cut. So any tear out that it would have occurred by my end mill is going to be removed. You know, so you always run your pocket cut first because your V bit's going to come back and clean up those edges. Uh, and hopefully that answers uh, that question for you, Peter. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about ball nose bits. So a ball nose bit is generally your 3D finish cutting bit. Uh, a ball nose bit has uh, a straight ball nose bit has a shank that has a ball uh, cutter, you know, a radius cutter at the end. Uh, and so therefore when it's coming and doing the 3D work and everything, uh, I'm going to end up with a radius, uh, you know, at that cut with kind of a straight wall. Okay, uh, depending on what my, you know, my model is and everything. And when the ball nose cuts, uh, it is cutting at the tip of the bit. So <clears throat> if I came in here and created a curve there. <clears throat> when that ball nose is cutting, it's cutting on the tip of the bit. You know, to create those 3D finish cuts and everything. You know, it's cutting on that tip. So ball nose bits, you're, you're very rarely, other than when you're doing the sidewall cuts, you know, when it's doing that first plunge down and everything. But on the 3D model cut, you know, it's the bottom of your model or the top of your model, should I say. Uh, that tip of the bit is doing a lot of the work because we generally have a straight end mill coming and doing what's called a 3D rough cut. So that straight end mill comes in and it hogs away all this waste material in here, leaving a small amount of material right above our model. And then our ball nose bit comes and removes the rest of that material down to our finished cut depth and that's working off the tip of the bit and things. And so, uh, we have those straight bit cutters well as we you know as we get deeper and deeper in things into those cuts you know we end up with that straight wall and that uh, you know that uh, we end up sometimes we get tool marks and stuff on those those lips and all well we also have a bit called a tapered ball nose and a tapered ball nose generally <coughs> has a shank and let's say that we were using the white side uh, SE 66 8th inch tapered ball nose it has a seven degree taper so from that quarter inch shank it has a seven degree tapered angle and then it has the eighth inch ball uh, at the bottom of the bit now when the uh, why would you use a tapered ball nose versus a straight ball nose? Well, a tapered ball nose allows me to get cut uh, deeper into the cuts, and it eliminates the tool marks that would generally occur uh, from a straight bit on those straight walls and things. Because when we calculate a tapered bit, the ball cutter is going to end up out away from our wall because the toolpath is going to calculate from the outer edge, that right edge or left edge, depending on if you're doing a climb or a conventional cut. But when we are cutting and things, uh, the top of our bit is going to go to our vector line, you know, whatever our vector line is in our drawing. And therefore, the bit is going to be cutting out here. So uh, we have this kind of angled cut uh, and if we had done a pocket cut beforehand, then you'll notice from time to time that there's always, a, when you create that finish cut, there's kind of a lip uh, out here. Um, let's see if I can draw that. Let's uh, trim this away. Oops, wrong line. Bear with me a second. So generally, 
you will see that there is a uh, kind of a lip, you know, from that rough cut to the finished cut. There's general lip where the, you know, where the bit was cutting um, that uh, it comes right up to the edge of that cut and that difference, you know, creates that kind of that lip cut. And so a tapered ball nose, a lot, uh, tapered ball nose bit allows us to get deeper into those hills and valleys and things, and eliminates the tool marks on the side walls of the cut. Uh, so you would generally, you know, uh, I generally always go for a tapered ball nose. The only time I would use a straight ball nose is if I want that straight cut. Uh, with a ball at the bottom and generally if I'm doing that then my um, my cut is generally got a flat bottom on it almost like a bowl cut you know in a sense uh, you know I, I'm creating a flat bottom you know type cut where I want that straight wall and all and uh, that that 3d finish so um, when you're choosing which bit uh, to use with the job uh, it really depends on what the job is you're doing so a pocket cut a pocket cut uh, is generally a flat end mill it's generally a flat end mill a but a pocket cut is not always a flat end mill what if I'm doing a pocket cut you know and I want that radius in the corner you know then I'm gonna use a bowl bit or maybe even a straight ball nose bit uh, depending on the radius of that ball nose bit I could still get that rounded cut and if you notice these two look about the same you know depending on that radius of that bit uh, and things um, Am I doing a pocket cut where I want the walls to have an angle to them, uh, such as raised text and stuff, and I want that nice V-cut angle? Then I'm going to choose a V-bit, uh, you know, uh, for that pocket cut. Uh, the V-bit that I use, depending on the angle, is going to determine the angle of my wall. So a pocket cut could be any bit that you want to use just depending on what it is that you're trying to what your finished result what you're trying to achieve a profile cut meaning that we're following a line anytime we are following a line cutting out a shape or cutting to a certain depth it's a profile toolpath now we could again use any bit that we want to i could use my straight bit for a profile cut my bowl bit, my V bits, my ball nose bits to follow that line. It all depends on what I'm trying to achieve. Now, if I'm cutting the part all the way out, cutting it all the way out, then I typically want a straight bit for that. If I'm cutting that part all the way out and everything, I'm generally using a straight bit. But what if I want my cut what if I want my cut to have a chamfered wall, kind of an angled wall and things on it? Um, bear with me a second. You know, what if I want to cut this part out, but I want a nice chamfer around the edge, a nice angle cut? You know, uh, the angle is going to be dependent on, of course, the bit, you know, 90, 60, what have you. Um, but I want that nice chamfer cut. Well, then I'm going to run two profile cuts. One is going to be using my end mill to cut all the way through the material. Okay. Uh, you know, depending on, you know, what the length of the bit is. Uh, you know, I'm going to be cutting all the way through the material. And then my other chant, my other uh, cut is going to be a profile toolpath because I'm still following that same line, but it's going to be a V bit that I'm going to be using, and you know to create that angled cut. Now, of course, let me size this V bit up to a more appropriate size to kind of represent this a little bit better because our chamfer wouldn't be that huge. Um, bear with me a second. get in there now 
um, you know, I want that chamfer cut, so I'm going to create that nice chamfer, uh, that nice angle, and let's uh, let's draw this out so it's actually more appropriate. Uh, this would be a straight line down, and trim this away. So I'm going to get that straight cut cutting through my material and then that chamfer at the top depending on what angle bit that I'm using. Now, a tool path, when you're cutting a profile tool path, you have the option to cut on the line, on the outside of the line, or on the inside of the line. Okay? And so this cut here, my part, would actually look something like this. And if I was cutting on the line, it's gonna take the right side of my bit and cut on the line from the widest diameter of that cutter. Well, that's why we have what's called allowance offsets. If we were to look at a tool path, a profile tool path, we have what's called an allowance offset here. And so when I'm cutting on the outside of the line, the right side of my router bit is cutting on the outside of the line, but I can set an allowance offset. How wide is that allowance offset in order to get that chamfer cut? Well, it depends on my bit. So if I were to measure this particular drawing of a V-bit here, if I were to measure the offset distance from the side of my bit to the tip of my bit, that offset is 0.3498 for this particular drawing. That means I have to offset my cut so that the bit moves over that distance and therefore the center of my bit is cutting on my line and that's going to allow it to remove that corner creating that chamfer okay so we offset that cut inward and it's a negative number we're going inward into our cut into our piece into our project that 0.3498 or whatever it was, it was because the toolpath is working off the right side of the bit for the outside of the cut and we need to offset that allowance to bring the center of the bit inward so we get that chamfer okay and everything so I could do two profile cuts one with my V bit to a certain depth typically the depth of the cutter right how you know the cutter from the tip of the bit to the you know where it starts to straighten out uh, so quarter inch whatever it may be to get that chamfer cut and then my other profile toolpath is going to be my straight bit which is cutting the part out you know cutting through the material cutting that part out and that's how I end up with that chamfer cut so your profile cuts again can be any bit that you're, you want to use, it just depends on what you're trying to achieve. Now, a V carve tool path is a V bit, okay? Uh, a V bit. Now, the only time I'm using an, anything other than the V bit is when I have a flat depth chosen and I have the option of using a flat area clearance tool. Then I'm using my V bit and my flat bit okay I'm using both of those bits to uh, complete that cut one for the angled cut and the other for the flat work okay so anytime I choose a V carved toolpath I'm choosing a V bit now what size V bit? 45 degree, 60 degree, 22 and a half, any of that. That all depends on the angle and the detail that I want in my cut. If I if I want, uh, you know, if I'm getting, uh, you know, where it's going to cut through because it's cutting too deep, or I want it to cut shallower, and I want that nice V cut, then I'm going to use a wider angle V bit. Um, a classic example is when I'm doing cast acrylic. 
when I'm cutting in cast acrylic, generally I'm cutting on 3 8 inch thick cast acrylic. And I am going to generally use my 60 degree V bit, but if I V carve in that cast acrylic, that 60 degree V bit is going to cut through the material depending on, you know, the space of my design, you know, the lines, you know, between the lines because a V carve cuts between the lines. So I generally set a flat depth for that 3 8 inch acrylic of 0.2. I truncate that V and create that flat bottom at a depth of 0.2. So that leaves a little material left over uh, and I'm not cutting through my material. But what if I wanted that nice V cut shape with a nice flat V bottom uh, or a nice V shaped bottom. I didn't want a flat depth. I want that nice, oops, uh, stand by one second. I want that nice V-shaped cut in my acrylic and all. Well, then I need to use a wider angle bit. So if I'm doing big letters and in my lit signs, I'm generally using a 120 degree V-bit when I'm carving uh, so that it gets that, it gets that nice V-cut, but it's gonna be shallow enough that it's not cutting through my material. So the you know it's just a matter of what it is that you're wanting to do and what your end result's going to be now let me get rid of these and let me size this back down a little bit Pull my v-bit back down there and so it, uh, oops, I want to do that. Okay, so it just depends on, you know, what type of cut and what you're trying to achieve. So rule of thumb, pocket cuts and profile cuts, they can be any bit, but generally if you're cutting out an object, you're generally using a straight end mill. Um, the uh, pocket cuts if I'm creating uh, mortise dados grooves and things where it has a flat bottom and straight walls and stuff because I'm fitting two pieces together that's generally a straight bit flat bit again the diameter of the bit the size of the bit that's all depending on you know what bit will fit in the area you're trying to cut V carve V carve toolpath is going to be a V bit uh, the only time I'm going to have another bit with that maybe a flat bit is if I'm using a flat area you know, if, I'm, if I have set a flat depth. My uh, engraving, uh, my inlays, um, my 3D rough cuts, 3D finish cuts, each of these have a general tool you're going to use. So let's look at the 3D rough cut. That's generally a straight flat bit. Uh, it's doing a rough cut. It's hogging out the waste material. Then my ball nose bit, whether it's a tapered ball nose or a straight ball nose, it's doing the finish work. So I'm going to be using a combination of the two. The rough cut uses a flat bit and the ball nose bit is the finish cut. But I've seen people use a ball nose bit to do the rough cut. That's fine. It's not, it's not like a, you're breaking a sacred rule or things, but generally generally you're using a flat end mill up cut spiral down cut straight cut doesn't matter uh, you're generally using a straight bit to do your rough cut but again some people are like oh I have I have a half inch ball nose but I don't have a half inch straight bit so I want to do a real quick hog out so I'm using my half inch ball nose bit and that's fine you know there's a reason for them doing that because it's a bigger bit larger diameter it's going to remove more material a little bit quicker uh, and, and things like that so they chose that bit but rule of thumb is you generally have a flat bit for your rough cut ball nose bit for your finish cut now straight or tapered well I don't, I only own one straight bit, one straight ball nose, an eighth inch straight ball nose. Um, most all of my ball nose are tapered bits because I want to be able to get into those deep hills and valleys and things uh, and not have a lot of tool marks to clean up and sand away and stuff like that uh, when I'm working. Uh, but it doesn't matter, either or. 
All I know is one thing that you have to be visually aware of when you're calculating your tool pass, when you're calculating your 3D finish tool path, make sure the bit that you use, if you sit there and grab the generic 0.25 ball nose, it's going to calculate the tool path for a straight bit, doing a straight cut. Using a, and if you're sitting there running a tapered bit in your uh, router and you've got the toolpath calculated for a straight bit, well, now you're not, it's going to be a completely different cut because the ball is coming out away from the wall. You know, it's because it's based on the side. So you got to make sure that you calculate your tools pass with the correct bit that you're going to be using because it creates two separate looking tool paths. It's based on the bit and the profile of that bit. So you got to be mentally aware of that. If I grab and just say, oh, I'm going to just use a 0.25 ball nose, that's a straight ball nose. But in my router, I grab my white side 705 bit set and grab my eighth inch tapered ball nose. Well, my cut's not going to come out right because I've got the toolpath calculated for one bit and I'm using a, a, another another style. So it's never going to look good. Okay? So you want to uh, basically uh, be able to... Uh, you want, not basically, you want to make sure that you're calculating your tool pass with the exact bit that you're going to be using okay if I calculate a 60 degree 0.25 V bit meaning that the shank is 0.25 and it comes down to a point like the white side 1541 but I'm using my a mana 60 degree V bit that has a half inch head those are two completely different looking bits so it's going to calculate things differently. Okay? Even though the angle's the same, it's going to calculate the toolpath differently based on that bit and the profile of that bit. Okay? And the diameter, should I say, the diameter of the bit. All right? So we got to be we got to be cautiously aware of that we're using the correct bits with the toolpaths we calculate them for. Um and now Jerry Williams asks in TNG how do I type in a new Z value offset in TNG how do I type in a new value Z offset um, Jerry uh, generally you would set your offset allowance in your tool path in your Vetrix software not in your TNG but if you are because it's it's not going to recalculate the tool path uh, in TNG all that is doing is if my start point is here uh, on let me see if I can get that line to click you know here and I set a Z offset then it's going to make my cut think that it's here so the only thing I'm doing is offsetting the depth of cut so when I zero out on the top of my board if I have my Z offset to something else whether it's negative or positive then my bits gonna be cutting either in the air or cutting too deep you know because my Z is offset so generally uh, you would not set a new Z value offset um, but you can you can set a Z value and, and a lot of times we are setting a Z value offset when we touch off the Z right when we zero out our Z what are we doing let's say here let's let's grab a rectangle and let's grab my bit okay when we touch off the Z what are we generally doing we are touching off on our ten thousandths of an inch touch plate right so on our ten thousandths of an inch touch plate when it's resting on the top of that material and we touch off that bit 
on the top of that touch plate, we're typing in a value of 0 0.01 in the Z box. Oops. Ow, let me make my text a little smaller. Bear with me a second. Okay, because from the top of our, oops, I don't know why I just wanted to open the text box there. From the top of our board to the top of the touch plate here, that's that distance of 0 0.01. So we're saying that right now when we zero out, our tip of our bit is 10 thousandths of an inch above the top of the board. Now, when we remove that touch plate, and we run our job, well, of course, it's calculating for Z0, right? Zero is the top of the board. But we had to type this in because we were touching off on the top of that touch plate. But now, what if I want the depth of cut to be a little bit deeper? So what if this is carving to a shallow depth and uh, you know it's carving around and everything and it's not very defined in the cut? Well, how can I make it cut deeper? Well, from zero, I can add to the number. So if I raise my bit up out of the wood, and let's say that my Z is currently says that my tip of my bit is setting at 0 0.025 above my, or 0.25 above my board. Where's my 0.25 at? It's hiding over here. Oh, come on now move over there so right now my Z box says it's my raised my bit up and the tip of my bit is sitting a quarter inch above my board well I can trick the machine I can tell it that it's actually sitting instead of at 0.25 I could I could add 20 thousandths of an inch to it telling it that it's sitting at 0.27 now that's gonna make my bit carve to whatever normal depth it would have carved to plus that 20 thousandths of an inch. So it's gonna cut that 20 thousandths of an inch deeper because the CNC machine thought that the bit was sitting 0.27 above zero, the top of the board, when it was actually only sitting at 0.25. So now it's gonna carve that 20 thousandths of an inch, that 0 0.02, you know that difference between 0.25 and 0.27. It's gonna carve that much deeper into the board. So I would add to it, uh, you know, and uh, that's how I can set my Z at, on the fly at the machine if I'm getting a carving and it's like, oh, it's not carving that deep. I can go into my Vetric software and I can recalculate the toolpath. When you recalculate the toolpath and you want the bit to cut deeper, that means that you are changing, oops, that means that you are changing the start depth the start depth instead of zero I'm gonna make it 0 0.02 meaning it's gonna carve 0 0.02 lower than the top of my zero right than, the, than my zero so I'm changing the start depth so I can do it in here and recalculate and rerun that toolpath or I can just look at my Z box in my software and whatever the number is that the Z is currently sitting at I can add that 0 0.02 to it and lock that in and make the machine think it's 20,000 higher above zero than it actually is. Either or. Hopefully that made sense and wasn't confusing. But Jerry, that's the only thing I can answer that question because a Z offset means that you're setting a different depth than what your zero is. You're setting something an offset distance. Okay, That's not the same as setting a XY offset. All right. So let's get rid of this. Now, any questions, any questions, uh, and I'm gonna go over the questions you guys have, I'm gonna go back through, but if you have any questions on bit choice, you know, how do I choose the bit for the job? You know, uh, your, hopefully I answered that. Uh, hopefully I, I answered that question and it wasn't confusing. Um, 
the choice of bit is going to be dependent on the type of cut that you're trying to do. So if you want the angle cut walls, it's a V-bit. If you want the flat walls, straight walls, and flat bottom, that's going to be your end mill. If you want a flat walls and flat bottom with a radius at the bottom, that's going to be something like either a ball nose, straight ball nose bit, or a bowl bit, you know, and um, and things. Now, be very uh, understanding that a CNC cannot do an undercut. So let's say that, oops, hold on a minute. Let me get my line straight here. If I'm doing a you know a straight bit or whatever, a CNC cannot do an undercut. An undercut is uh, where it is it goes in from the cut. The bit cannot cut inward. Uh, you know it can't do an undercut. Uh, the bit that you would use typically for that type of undercut is a dovetail bit. A dovetail bit generally has a cutter on it that has that capability of undercutting uh, so you would use a dovetail bit now a dovetail bit you would not calculate or put into your tool database because uh, you would set it as a generic straight end mill but you would just use the um, you would just use the uh, Instead of using an end mill, you would use your dovetail bit in that cutter. And so, you know, if I want to, if I need an undercut, if I'm doing like a sliding dovetail or something, or a keyhole or whatever, I'm going to use a keyhole bit or I'm going to use a dovetail bit, you know, uh, and, and things like that. But a, you know, your straight bits, your ball bits, your ball nose, your V bits, they cannot do undercuts. An undercut is where it comes in from the edge of the cut that inward angle it's an undercut okay uh, 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 see excuse me I got the hiccups uh, CNC can't do that unless you're using a bit that actually does undercutting like a like a dovetail bit okay um, and uh, so and we're gonna talk about you know keyholes and dovetails and things like that uh, later on uh, the jig that uh, uh, edge jig that or wedge jig um, I've got it all drawn up uh, but I don't have the instructions and if I just guy if I give you the the picture drawings a lot of you will be able to figure it out uh, but uh, there's some that, that you know need instruction especially on how to create those keyhole tool paths the the the, the t-track tool paths but using a keyhole bit to do it not a t-track bit you know and a t-track bit is uh, let's say that we have uh, bear with me a second. Bear with me a minute. Bear with me. Let me see if I can draw this out. That's about the funkiest looking... Uh, Dove, or keyhole bit uh, let me uh, fix that for a moment if I select this hold down my shift key and select these two guys right here and hit the letter Y on my keyboard I can pull them up All right create that nice angle there so a t-track bit uh, or cut uh, using a keyhole bit or whatever means that I'm you I'm, I've got a bolt of some sort uh, and a nut you know that slides into that uh, t-track and uh, you know it kind of traps it so that when I tighten up that nut it can't you know go that far therefore anything that I'm securing oops uh, anything that I'm securing is going to get you know clamped down to the 
top surface of my board. And so um, keyhole bits, believe it or not, can be used to create T-tracks. It's just a matter of uh, you know how wide you want your T-track and the keyhole bit. Like for me, for that jig, I used my keyhole bit, which had a 3 16 inch diameter cutter. Uh, and uh, I forget what size the head was. Uh, let me redraw this. Let me square this up a little bit. And when I came to cut to that depth, you know, whatever it may be, I needed to do multiple passes. So it ended up creating a shallow T track. And as I ran that cut in one, two, three passes, it was able to cut and make that T-track for me, giving me enough lip that would hold my my T-bolts, my nuts, you know, all of that stuff from, uh, you know, being able to pull out or slip out and stuff. You know, it still got that same effect. But I didn't use a T-slot cutting bit. I used a keyhole bit. And so it's I, it, what the, the whole point of that, this little talk here is, is, you have to think about the cut that you're wanting to achieve, uh, the outcome that you're wanting to achieve, and then you use the appropriate bit to accomplish that goal. Okay? And for this cut, if we were looking at it from straight on, like from the top down, let's say that this was my board, I literally am taking and running a straight line with my bit and as my bit comes let's see if I can this is from looking straight down so we would let's draw the bit let's draw the shank in here come on you can do it there we go okay so if we were looking from the top down my bit is literally following a profile cut, cutting that line, right? Profile cut on the line. And when it's finished cutting, I have it go back home, you know, back out of the wood. And I end up, if I'm looking from the side, I end up with a cut that looks like this. So all we're doing is running a straight line cut with our bit. And, you know, the end result would be, you know, if we were looking at the side view, would be our little keyhole slot and things. So it's you just choose the bit for the job you want to do. Uh, and once you know the general rules, you know, when to use a V bit, V carving, when to use a straight bit, pocket cut or 3D rough cutting, uh, profile cutting, if I'm cutting through the material, uh, when to use a ball nose bit, 3D finish detail work, you know, these little simple uh, little rules of thumb. Then from there, you know, you know what bit to use. Now the size of the bit, the diameter and all, that's all based on uh, the bit has to be able to fit in the area that it's cutting. If it cannot fit, it's not going to create the tool path for it. Okay. All right. So let's look at, let's look at uh, some of the questions uh, that uh, you guys got here. So let's go back up to the top. Let's see here. So Dennis uh, Frazen earlier on uh, asked um, uh, asked if what do I feel a safe spot is for from a 3D rough cut to a 3D finish. So on my 3D cuts, I generally leave an allowance of about 0 0.04. 
uh, forty thousandths of an inch. So uh, bear with me a second. Let me. Let me offset this outward 0 0.04. Okay. So my rough cut, my rough bit is generally leaving a 0 0.04 uh, bit of material above my model for my finished bit to clean up. Now, keep this in mind. If I'm using a flat bit, it's not going to create these curves. It's going to create, you know, flat areas. So let's pop up here. Stand by a moment. So depending on my pass depths and everything for my uh, straight bit, and of course the diameter of my straight bit, it's going to rough out this cut uh, to, let's move over a little bit so we can all see this. Um, it's going to you know, rough out this cut to wherever it can cut, wherever it can fit, you know, leaving that four thousandths or forty thousandths of an inch material above my finish cut. Then my ball nose bit is going to come and do all the finish work down to removing that forty thousandths and all. So for me, a forty thousandths of an inch allowance is a good, safe distance. Now, Peter came back uh, when I asked the question about do you use the uh, end mill or the V bit first? Um, no, Peter, the answer is no. Peter asked the question, then the V bit is duplicating the flat area tool? No. The V carve with flat depth creates two tool paths, one for the V bit, one for the end mill. And those two tool paths are completely different. The flat bit is going to do all the hogging and waste away materials down to that flat area and all. And it's going to rough around the, the letters. And then the V bit is going to come and do just around the letters and around the outer edge of the walls and stuff. It does not duplicate the end mill. It's two completely separate tool paths. And they are doing two completely separate jobs. They're not duplicating each other. Okay, hopefully that answered that question, Peter. Uh, let's see here. Um, and Doug uh, jumped in and answered that as well. Thanks, Doug. Uh, let's see here. William asked, any difference between a ball nose and a ball nose conical or just terminology? All right, who's not paying attention in class? No, I'm just kidding. All right, so a tapered ball nose, another name for a tapered ball nose is a conical ball nose. So the difference between a conical or tapered ball nose, because those are the same thing, and a straight ball nose is a straight ball nose has a straight shank and then it rounds off at the end. A tapered or conical ball nose has that tapered angle then the ball at the end of the taper. So that is the difference between the two. A tapered ball nose is a conical ball nose. Good question, William. Um, and uh, Rochelle says, if I'm adding a new bit and I am asking how many flutes, how many flutes, uh, and it, how do I determine how many flutes it has? Okay, uh, generally flutes is not in um, 
the uh, when it's at when you're adding bits in the tool database but flutes comes into play when we're calculating chip load so uh, Rochelle stand by I'm gonna be answering that question when we start talking about RPMs chip load feed rate pass depth and all we're about to jump into that right now I want to get past the questions about choosing bits and then we're going to jump into how to set up the tool all right so Rochelle keep that I'll keep that question in mind because it will get answered during the next part um, and Doug jumped in and answered that question about the gullets he's correct you know you look at that and it'll tell you how many flutes um, but still we're going to talk about that in a minute okay so let's see how um, Rick if you run out of questions and update on the mini magnet dust shoe <laughs> okay uh, we're about a week now the one new thing uh, guys I've uh, got it on the um, uh, it's going on the website I have part of it up but I didn't get it finished uh, it's gonna be $24.99 but we knew we do have a new uh, holder for the uh, probe digital probe for the mini carver a uh, little holder for the mini carver for the digital probe and um, if you stand by a moment I'll give a little show and tell of that real quick a little show no tell I'll just show you what it looks like uh, give me one second We're about a week, a uh, week to a week and a half out on the dust shoe, on the dust shoe for the mini carver, um, and so uh, we're about a week out on that. And let's see here if I can. Uh, see if I can pop this over. Uh, the pictures are sideways, so I have to tilt your head. But uh, we knew we have a new holder for the digital probe that mounts to the side of the mini carver uh, that holds the digital probe. Uh, all the pictures are sideways. That's why I haven't got them up on the website yet. Uh, but um, there we go. There's an upright photo. So it mounts on the side for holding the digital probe. Uh, on to the mini carver so we have that accessory it's gonna be $24.99 that'll be on the website this evening uh, with its price and stuff but um, the dust brush for the mini carver we're about a week and a half out still for it to be released on the market all right so William says in the instance you are explaining uh, in, in the instance you are explaining is the step over Dennis asked about the offset uh, asked about in the offset the same or was offset not the word to use so let's go back up to Dennis's question let me see if because I missed that one what do you feel is a safe spot for the step over for 3d engraving with the bits i just went over that answer on dennis's question uh is that what you were referring to william is when you were saying he was talking about the offset um the safe spot is uh the difference between the rough cut and the 3d cut um now if you're talking about the step over for 3d engraving with the bits that step over is going to be determined by the angle of the cutter. If you're using an eighth inch end mill with a seven degree angle or an eighth inch end mill with a 5.4 degree angle, it's going to be based on the cutter when it's calculating that tool path. That's why I say it's very important to have the appropriate tool in the tool path when you're calculating it. Because if you're using a different tool, you're going to get the wrong cut because it's calculating it based on the tool diameter and angle of the cutter the tool and everything so the step over is determined by the tool path and the bit being used now if you're talking about the 
uh, offset allowance between a rough cut and a 3D finish cut, 40 thousandths of an inch is a good safe distance. And that in the 3D uh, cut, whoops, oops, bear with me. That in the 3D finish, uh, that is uh, determined by the machining allowance. Now, the boundary offset, if that's what you guys are referring to, this is how far the you want the router to stay bit to stay away from the line. So let's say that uh, this. Uh, let me get out of here. Let's say that this was my model here and we're looking from the top down this is the profile of the model the profile of the model well my allowance is either going to allow that bit to go beyond the line or it's going to force it to stay away from that line depending on if I have a negative or a positive offset Generally, when we're doing a 3D rough and a 3D finish, we're setting a positive offset to allow it to go beyond the boundary of the model so that we can get around the edges of that model, especially if I have a nice round over edge or something. It allows it to get to the bottom of that model cut. Um, an example would be, let me make this a little bigger. If I... Let me uh, let me do this. Ah, bear with me a second. This dotted line here is going to represent my boundary limit. Okay, which is the profile, the boundary limit. If I tell it to stay away from that boundary limit, then it's not going to let the bit go up to the boundary. Therefore, it's not going to be able to carve the rest of this curve. If I have no boundary limit, then it's going to go right up. It's going to take the right side of that bit right up to the line, which again, it's going to not let the bit get to the finish of that curve. So I generally set a boundary offset to allow the bit to go usually its own diameter, one diameter of the bit. So that way when it's carving, now it can go past that line. So now it can come and carve this, this round over. So we're allowing it to pass the boundary of the model. So I typically allow it to go beyond that model one of its diameter. If it's a quarter inch bit, it's a 0.25 offset, you know, boundary offset. And I let it go beyond so it can finish that cutoff. But if I limit it away from the line, then it's only going to cut up to a certain point. Then my model's not going to get finished on that edge. Okay? So your boundary offset is generally letting the bit go beyond the line, not up to it. Hopefully that answered that question. All right. <clears throat> okay, Howard, your your question is, huh? <laughs> uh, be a little bit more specific. Uh, and I'll see what I can do with that. Yeah, so the step over. Now, all right, William, step over, that's a completely different thing as well. That's We're going to talk about step over when we start talking about bit settings, okay? Which, uh, that would be a good leeway into bit settings. So now, let's talk about our tool database and our bit settings, okay? So when we are setting our bits, whoops, let's try that again. 
when we're setting up our bits, see if I can get this a little bit bigger for you guys. When we're setting up our bits, uh, we have to put in information like the diameter, the side angle, tip radius, if we're using a, you know, a tapered ball nose option like I got here, uh, pass depth, step over, clearance step over, spindle speed, feed rate, plunge rate. You know, if I'm using an end mill, um, then I'm asked for the diameter of the cutter, the pass depth and the step over, then the spindle speed, the feed rate and the plunge rate. Uh, if I'm using a V-bit, then I'm asked for the diameter of the cutter, not the shank. Uh, I'm asked for the pass depth, the angle of the cutter, uh, the final pass step over, the clearance pass step over, spindle, feed rate, and plunge rate. So there's different things depending on the type of bit. There's different bits of information that the tool database needs. Now, as a general rule of thumb, from day one when you guys got your machine, I've given you recommendations on the settings of your bits. Uh, and these are just general generic settings for a good all around kind of feed rate, plunge rate, step over and all that stuff for your bits. Uh, that file was called the uh, um, the speed and feed chart, digital woodcarver owner speed and feed chart. And that was in the Facebook group. But we're going to go beyond that now. We're going to go beyond the generic settings. And we're going to look at we're going to look at in-depth settings to uh, be able to determine the most optimal cutting for our bit and our material. Now, this is not um, this is not a uh, guarantee. It's going to vary between the type of the material and things like that. But I'm going to give you a generic uh, bit of information. Okay, so bear with me one second while I do that. Stand by a moment. Let me pull it over. I thought I had it ready, but I didn't. So bear with me two seconds. Stand by guys, stand by. Come on now. Work with me there, Junior, work with me. Ah, uh, this PC chip load. Okay, so I'm going to open up a file, and it's going to be just a generic chip load chart. Um, this is kind of a general chip load. Uh, let's find it here. Chip, 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 chip. And this is kind of the uh, basic settings, uh, the basic settings for chip load. Let's see if I can get this to zoom in for us. Okay, it's going to be a little bit blurry. Sorry about that. But... Uh, Yes, Chuck, we always change the passes for our tools based on, you know, how, how aggressive or non-aggressive we want to be with the cut. We'll get into that in just a minute. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, okay, uh, Howard, I got you now. Um, all right, so based on, so chip load 
is um, determined. It's based on the material thickness, okay, uh, and then you know of average size, and then also your tool cutter, uh, your router bit, and the and an average size uh, cutting length of the flute. Now this is going to vary based on thicker material, and it's going to vary based on uh, longer you know bits with longer cutting flutes and things you know extended bits and stuff like that. So this is um these are recommendations okay uh and they are uh to be taken as that recommendations they are they do not this does not uh account for all types of hardwood softwood plywood nbf you know it's going to vary uh based on the thickness of that material and the cutter that you're using and stuff um so uh, you've got to understand that you know damage to your bit, bit breakage, and stuff like that can still occur. This is not a albeit uh, um, chart, but this is a good reference chart based on the diameter of the tool. And we've got some general diameters here: eighth inch, quarter inch, three eighths, and half inch and up. In our different types of material like hardwood softwood and plywood, MDF and particle board, high pressure laminate, phenolic, uh, hard plastic, soft plastic, solid surface, Corian countertops, acrylic and aluminum. These are going to be your chip loads. Uh, basically the size of the chips that are going to be expelled if you're, ha if you're at your optimal settings, your, your, your RPMs, your feed rate and everything for that particular bit. Now, how do we determine how do we determine chip load? Well, you guys are going to get be fortunate enough here in a day or two you're going to have a chip load calculator that I'm actually creating for you. Uh, that you'll be able to program in information like your feed rate, your RPMs, your uh, bit diameter, and it'll give you the, the chip load. Or if you pull off the chart, uh, it'll give you that you can type in the chip load and then uh, it'll tell you the, the uh, proper feed rate and, and RPMs and stuff. But here's the formulas. You guys didn't think you were going to get a math lesson in this one, did you? Um, so... All right, so chip load. Chip load. This this chart back here is determined by, and let's let me type this out. And let me get uh, let me get kind of in the middle of the screen here. And let me make my font bigger. Hold on a second. Uh, format my font. Let's go with a 18, 18. All right, excellent. So chip load is found by, it equals, or basically uh, your feed rate, okay? Your feed rate in inches per minute and if you're going to do inches per second you want to be technical difficulty on that one just multiply that by 60 or divide by 60 but anyway uh, feed rate inches per minute because that's what we generally work on divided by divided by our rpms of the router multiplied by the number of flutes of the bit okay so i will give you an example uh if our chip load or let's say our feed rate is uh 85 inches a minute okay and we were running the router at 24,000 
RPMs with a two flute straight cutter. All right, two flute straight cutter. We would take that and this 24,000 times two then becomes, we're gonna move over a little bit. Uh, this becomes uh, 48,000. Okay, so that 48,000 is divided, you know, 85 divided by 48,000. And if we do our math, this one I'm going to have to bring a calculator in for. That's what I'm going to be creating for you as a chip load calculator. But if we take that 85 divided by 48,000, that gives us a chip load of 0.0017. Okay. 0 0.0017 and in the uh, you know speed and feed chart oops daggum it zoomed out on me hold on a second let me zoom it back in the uh, speed and feed chart we would look at you know what category we fall in so uh, at that 85 inches a minute, uh, 24,000 RPMs, um, you know, uh, we're tipping, we're not quite acquiring 0 0.0017, right? Uh, we're not quite acquiring uh, the proper chip load for an eighth inch end mill because it's for in our hardwood. Um, pretty close in our in our softwood or plywood. Uh, definitely in our hard plastic we are we're, we're good we're kind of good there 0 0.002 so we're, we're right in that ballpark so we're getting optimal chips from that cut so what if we use the chart so the optimal chip load for hardwood is 0 0.003 so we know the chip load how do we determine the feed rate or the RPMs well if you guys know anything you know about math which has been a long time since we've all been in school and so for me it's a little difficult sometimes to remember but if I need to know the feed rate I can take my RPMs times the number of flutes for the router times the chip load and that will give me the recommended RP or the recommended feed rate for my settings for my bit okay so once again if we use kind of the information we have up here if I take my oops let me back up a little bit if I take my 24,000 RPMs and I multiply that by the number of flutes and then I multiply that by the chip load so if I take my we'll take our 48,000 here 48,000 and I multiply that by the chip load and let's use the uh, lower side of the chip load 0 0.003 that's going to give me my feed rate recommended feed rate for those settings okay so if we do our math here 48,000 which is the RPMs times the number of flutes where we're talking about a two flute cutter here times 0 0.003 my recommended feed rate for the optimal chip load is around 144 inches a minute okay for that two flute cutter all right and you know so and then from there you know as our chips get bigger that number will you know decrease so the what if I know the chip load I know the number of flutes I know the feed rate but I want to set my rpms you know what setting should I set my rpms well that
RPMs is found by the feed rate divided by the number of flutes of the router times the chip load okay so if I know that my feed rate is 75 uh, inches a minute let's say I'm running 75 inches a minute and I take the number of flutes that I have I'm using a two flute cutter four flute cutter three flute cutter whatever it may be and I multiply that by the chip load which in this case I'm looking right behind here the 0 0.003 inches right um, so that will give me my feed rate okay so let's do the math on that two times 0 0.003 equals 0 0.006 right 0 0.006 so 75 divided by 0 0.006 equals 12,500 RPMs, okay? So for my two flute cutter, I'm going to be running, I'm not going to be running 24,000 RPMs. I'm going to be running around 12,000 RPMs for that eighth inch end mill in hardwood for the optimal chip load. Now. The big question is, Laney, if I have the Hitachi router and I don't have a spindle and I can't program in the RPMs and all I have is that dial one through six, you know, how do I know what the RPMs for those dials are? Okay, so for the Hitachi M12 VC router, These are the RPMs for those dial numbers. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay? Now, these are the RPMs at a no load run. A no load means that uh, not cutting. Uh, you know, um, the, uh, if there's a load on it, you know, when it's actually routing and everything, those RPMs could vary, you know. But these are the general settings of that one through six. So if my RPMs for that eighth inch end mill that I'm carving in hardwood, uh, you know, uh, the optimal RPMs is 12,500, then I'm gonna, my dial is going to be between the two and the three. Okay? For that optimal chip load. And I'm making chips, not dust. You know, and now heat is getting expelled from the bit, so I'm extending the life of my cutter and things. So we want to make sure that we set the proper feed rate, the proper RPMs, and uh, you know, uh, and everything for the optimal cut. And we can use this chart. We can utilize this chart, and I'll provide this chart for you guys. But you have to understand that this is generally a it's a generic chart okay it is not set in stone that for every piece of hardwood that i cut from purple heart to cherry that this is my chip load okay it's going to vary it's going to vary based on the thickness of my wood the density of course but it's going to based on the, the the length of my cutter and things but this will be for an average three quarter inch board and stuff like that uh, probably up to one inch uh, to an average cutter uh, which is generally uh, you know three-eighths to one inch uh, flute cutting flute uh, these numbers will these chip loads ranges will come in you know handy and stuff uh, so if you need to make note of this to determine the chip load it's the feed rate Divide in inches per minute divided by the RPMs times the number of flutes. If you need to know the feed rate, 
and you know the chip load you can probably get chip load information from the router bit manufacturer but it has nothing to do with the router bit it has to do with the router bit and the thickness of the material so this chart is a good little guide but again it's a generic guide but if you know the chip load or the range of the chip load you can multiply that by the number of flutes multiply that by your rpms to get that feed rate and if you need to know the rpms you take your feed rate divided by the number of flutes times the chip load to get that rpm setting you know so there's you got to do math you know guys we got to go back to school sometimes now here's what you do how do we how do we how do we optimize this so we don't have to sit here and do these equations all the time we test cut we test cut so if i am carving in wood and you're gonna you're gonna look at your chips you're gonna look at the cuts and all and you're gonna see if you're making chips and not dust and stuff and you want good sized little chips coming out but if I'm carving in pine okay I'm gonna try that pine at different rpms and different feed rates and stuff uh, to see you know what gives me a better cut as far as where I'm making chips and not fine dust okay well I'm getting more chips than I am dust and once I have that then I'm going to log in that information and generally I would use a spreadsheet of some sort um, and make a little log for myself bear with me a second while this pop-up comes up there we go all right so I would have a categories of pine. That's a pin, not pine, that's pin. Pine. Uh, poplar. Walnut. Maple. Cherry all these different types of materials purple hearts and things like that I'd start kind of making notes for myself as I'm test cutting or as I'm carving you know I can look at the you know get different results and things and then I'm going to have I'm going to have the size of my bits my 0.25 end mill eighth inch or one uh, you know 0 0.0625 eighth inch quarter inch sixteenth of an inch uh, what have you and um, actually I need to do it the other way this one should be uh, this one should be the letters all the way down pine maple poplar uh walnut cherry examples and then up here is going to be my tool my rpms feed rate uh that's really all I need to know plunge rate uh, you're just gonna have a general setting for your plunge rate uh, generally between 10 and 20 inches a minute for your plunge rate because that's when you know that's how fast it's plunging the bit in uh, but uh, we can have that in there as well too um, now this is uh, for determining you know kind of my my chip load and things and so I could have you know the category of uh, chip load and Pine is a softwood, so that's going to be 0 0.003 uh, to um, gosh, that we can't do that because that's all determined on uh, the size of the material and the bit. Uh, because I'm going to have a lot of different tools for the pine category, so let's do this. Uh, insert 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 
So because for that pine, I'm going to have my 0.125 cutter. I'm going to have my quarter inch cutter, my eighth inch end mill. I'm going to have my V bits, all that stuff. But, you know, we're generally talking about your straight cutters, up cut spiral, down cut spiral, things like that. Um, and uh, so I'm going to have all those different bits. So now I can set my chip load. Uh, 0.003 to 0 0.005, uh, 0.009 to 0.015, and I uh, forgot what half inch was. Got to look at my chart. Um, oh, I was 0 0.011, not 1.5. 3 eighths half inch so 0.019 to 0.21 and so you would create a little chart for yourself and once you have that chart once you have that chart and you have your optimal RPMs and things um, you know whatever it may be uh, whatever your feed rate is your plunge rate once you have that kind of chart and things then you can actually go into your Vetric software and you can set up your tool database with all your tools and you can set it up based on wood so if I come in here and I type in if I click on Imperial tools and I type in new group I can type in pine wood and then under that group I can have all of my tools under that group and their proper settings for the feed rate and the plunge rate for those tools. So I'm going to have my tools in the tool chart six or seven times over, but in the general woods that I'm usually carving in, I'm going to have the, that list, that pine, poplar, walnut, maple, cherry, mahogany. You know the woods that I generally work in all the time plywood right plywood you know soft which falls under the softwood category but still plywood uh, acrylic aluminum you know I'm gonna have these different categories and then under those categories I'm gonna have those bits with the settings for my spindle speed feed rate and plunge rate now if you have the router you need this number here is just for your information it's not going to do anything you have to use the dial on your router and again that dial settings number one two three four and five make note of them they're also in your Hitachi user manual if you guys have the Bosch or the Porter cable that's in your Bosch book and your Porter cable, you know, what those dial numbers are, what RPMs they're set at and stuff, and your ranges and things. And uh, that way you know to turn the dials to and stuff. So right now, all of you, nine times out of ten, are running all your bits at the number six dial because that's what I've told you to do. Just keep the router on number six, and, you know, your feed rate's going to be uh 55 inches a minute 15 inch a minute plunge you know for your uh end mill your quarter your eighth inch end mill quarter inch end mill and all and i've given you those generic basic settings all around just good settings whatever but now you're getting more and more involved more and more advanced in your carving and things you want to start you know extending the life. you want to start thinking about extending the life of your bits wear and tear you want to start thinking about you know uh pro optimal cuts you know chip loads and things like that so now it's just one more thing that you got to start thinking about and all and then you want to go in and set up your tool database appropriately you know your feed rates and plunge rates and things so let's back off that for a moment because that involves your chip load proper chip load involves feed rate and RPMs and then of course the number of flutes of your cutter all right but Let's talk about the actual tool database and setting up our tools, okay? And so, let's say that I'm setting up my 
uh, quarter inch down cut spiral. The diameter that it asked me for when I'm setting up an end mill, it's asking me for the diameter. That's the diameter of the cutter, not the diameter of the shank, the diameter of the cutter. So it'd be a quarter of an inch in my case. Now my pass depth, rule of thumb, pass depth is set to half the diameter of the cutter or less. Okay, half the diameter of the cutter or less. So generally, for the quarter inch cutter, your pass depth is an eighth of an inch per pass. Your step over, your step over is 50% the diameter of the cutter or less. And your step over is going to vary depending on what it is you're wanting to achieve. I generally step over 33.3%, a third of my bit. That way I have overlap in those cuts. What is step over? Well, let's talk about what is step over. So, step over is the distance, the bit, steps over from one line to the next. So if I am stepping over 33 and a third, 33%, one third, right? So if I take my 0.25 and divide that by three, and I'm stepping over for each cut, each line that it's making, my bit, after it makes that cut, that's how far it's stepping over before it makes the second cut, the third cut, fourth cut, when it's going back and forth cutting. When it's doing an offset cut, that's how far it's stepping over when it's offsetting outward in that spiral motion. So that spiral motion You know, that's how far the center of the bit is stepping over from one cut to the next, to the next. So step over is how far it steps over. And your rule of thumb is 50% the diameter of the bit or less. Okay, 50% the diameter of the bit or less. And so the um, you know, uh, generally, like for me, 33 and a third percent. But if you look at my other end mills and stuff, let's say my white side bit, I've got it set to 40 inches per minute. Or, you know, um, my ball nose bits, they're set at, you know, 15% or an 8% of step over and stuff of the diameter of the cutter and all. So it's all going to be based on the bit. And so we're going to talk about our ball nose bits here in a second. But now for my end mill, my feed rate, now if I have a router, I have the Hitachi router. So this number, okay, this RPM is gonna vary depending on the type of material and the cutter, the flute that I'm cutting. If I'm specific, like this is my white side 705.25 end mill, which is a two flute cutter, then you know I now I know the specific bit I'm using. But if it's a four flute cutter or a three flute cutter, I might want to put that information up here. You know, I might want to put that information up here in the name so I know it's a three flute or a two flute or what have you. Um, but I don't have to. I just know that it is. But if you want to be, you know, uh, uh, you know, straight about it, you can put notes in here. You can make notes, you know. Um, but this number is going to be, you know, based on, uh, you know, general information. So let's say that uh, I set this for twenty-two thousand RPMs. Okay. And 
if I if that's what I want to run this at, and I'm going to turn my dial on my router between five and six, because I'm running 22,000 RPMs right there, somewhere in that middle area there, closer to the six than I am the five, then you know I want to make sure that I'm running the proper feed and speed and things and stuff. So if I if this bit that I'm setting up is in my pine category my pine category then I'm gonna look at my softwoods here for that quarter inch cutter and my range is from 0.01 to 0.03 for that chip load that optimal chip load and again this is generic but if I know my RPMs oops if I know my RPMs and I know the uh, number of flutes that I'm cutting with. And again, just so you guys, you know, we're, we're, we're finding out the feed rate, right? We're trying to determine the feed rate. So that's the RPMs times the number of flutes times the chip load. So if I know my RPMs, then I'm going to multiply that by the number of flutes and multiply that by my chip load, which in this case I'd probably use the lower end, uh, maybe the middle, 0.012, right? Middle range. So if I multiply that by 0.012, that's going to give me a feed rate. Well, that feed rate is absolutely ridiculous 528 inches a minute. That means I need to slow my RPMs down okay I can't run it at 22,000 RPMs so I then come back and say you know I want to be in the range why well, I always tell you guys you have a range of 35 to 75 inches a minute that you're working in if I say okay I want to run at 65 inches a minute and I know my chip load and I know my feed rate is that you know 65 inches a minute and I know my number of flutes now I can set my RPMs appropriate because for this 528 inches a minute is not practicable and not doable on my 2440 or my mini carver so I have to adjust my RPMs appropriately so I'm gonna take my feed rate and I'm going to divide that by my number of flutes times my RPMs, or times my uh, chip load, because I'm trying to find the RPMs. So let's go back to our little chart again. I'm trying to find the RPMs. So I'm going to take my feed rate and divide it by the number of flutes times the chip load. So if I come over here and say, okay, my number of flutes is two. My chip load is 0.012. Okay, that gives me a 0 0.024. Then I'm going to take that and take my 75 inches a minute divided by 0 0.024, and that's going to give me and RPMs and did I do that right bear with me a second because that's low hold on a second Peter yeah let's do that one more time uh, 75 inches a minute oops let's do this first number of flutes 2 times 0.012 which is my on my chip load chart for softwood 1012 yep uh, that gives me yeah 0 0.024 so 75 inches a minute divided by 0 0.024 is 3125 right that's the optimal chip load that's the optimal RPMs well I can't do that my router only goes down to 8000 RPMs and everything so I need to kind of make an adjustment I need to be running probably about maybe a hundred inches a minute Oops.
Mm, it's not going to work out. Because uh, I got I have the restrictions of my router. My router only goes down to 8,800 RPMs. So, let's go... If I want to run... If I want to run 75, 80 inches a minute, need my RPMs. Not going to be able to get that low, so I'm going to be running, you know, a small amount with that quarter inch bit. And am I using, am I even in the quarter inch bit category? Bear with me a second. Let me make sure. I should be. Where's my little chart at? I am. Yeah. Softwood or plywood. So I'm going to try to do my best to meet this range, but if I can't, then I'm going to be a little higher. So I won't be running the optimal chip load of the bit because I can't go 528 inches a minute. I can run down to 150 with my, you know, 2440 or I can run, you know, 0.7, you know, 125 inches a minute with my mini carver. So I've got to set my range appropriately. So I'm probably going to be, uh, around the 12,500 range and uh, I'll probably end up being around 75 and then the plunge rate is going to be 15. I only want to plunge 15 inches a minute. So again, this chart is not a guarantee. It's just a suggestion, recommendation, but it's going to vary based on the bit, based on the thickness of the material. But also, you're going to have to, you've got restrictions, your cutters, your machine, your settings and things. So, you know, how, what your router limitations and stuff. So you're going to have to find, you know, what's good for you. That's why we test cut and we look at what gives us the best chips. You know, when we're cutting, what, with our bit not struggling, uh, and it gives us the best chips the best size chips and things, you know, at the at the rate we're running, then that's the settings we're going to use. You know, we're looking for the best chips that we can get. And again, you're going to set your bits appropriately. So that feed and speed chart that I gave you is a generic setting. That's a good all around setting for any type of material and stuff. But now you're starting to get a little bit more advanced, you know, or a little bit more knowledge a little bit more involved you got to get a little bit more technical now you know we want to start calculating the proper rpms we want to start looking at the extent the life extension of our bits we want to start looking about being in the right range of our feed rate and plunge rate and all when it comes to pass depth and step over 50 percent the diameter of the bit or less okay anywhere within that range half of the bit diameter or less that's up to you, whatever range. Now, I don't like being aggressive with my ball nose bits, so they usually tend to have a smaller pass depth, you know, than half the diameter of the bit or less. You know, they definitely have a smaller step over. So if we look at our ball nose bits, the ball nose bits, we have a very tight step over, a very tight step over, because we want a clean model cut. We want that step over to be super tight. So in this case of that uh, eighth inch diameter bit, I'm going to step over ten thousandths of an inch. So on my eighth inch diameter bit, oops. I'm stepping over ten thousandths of an inch which means that bit is when it's cutting after it finishes cutting that line it steps over it's cutting just ten thousandths of an inch step over super tight super clean 3d model finish cut okay so 
generally for my finish cutting all of my ball nose bits all of my ball nose bits have an 18 percent step over and a clearance pass step over that ranges between 10 and 15 percent so but they all have an 8% step over. Super tight because those bits are my 3D finish cutting bits. Okay, 8% step over, 8% step over. Okay. All right. So it's a tight step over, but your wider bits, your, your end mills and things like that, you know, 40% the bit, 50%, uh, you know, a third of it, quarter of it whatever you know you just want to be 50% or less on that all right let's make sure that um, Yeah, you're gonna get lots of buffering guys while I'm opening up different uh, you know pictures and windows and things and all that um, so your Chuck the feed rate uh, your 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 rapid rate is 150 inches a minute for the 2440 for the mini carver it's 125 inches a minute your rapid rate is 150 for the 2440 125 for the mini carver now we don't recommend you run up to 150 inches a minute we'd like you to stay within the range of 35 to 100 and not exceed 100 um you know just for you know just general use of the machine but again you can run up to you know 150 just know that i mean that's movement you know that's wear and tear on the machine so uh replacing parts and all that stuff maintenance 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 parts replacements and stuff motor burnout and things and all so uh but you can run to the maximums and stuff so uh now joe asked the question um does the depth of or Bob asked the question then Joe followed up so Bob asked the question does depth of cut make a difference absolutely uh, that's what the pass depth is 50% the diameter of the bit so um, I'm not gonna run uh, eighth inch bit an eighth inch deep or a quarter inch deep or eighth inch deep whatever uh, I'm not gonna run it uh, deep at 144 inches a minute or two you know 150 inches a minute or 100 inches a minute because if the bit cannot keep up doesn't matter if i'm making chips or not if that bit cannot keep up with the feed rate if it can't remove those chips fast enough then i'm gonna snap my bit in half i don't care if it's a half inch diameter bit you can break it right in half if it can't keep up and remove the chips fast enough and all so chip load you know your optimal making chips and everything has nothing to do with being able to keep up with the depth you know the cut so you don't want to be too aggressive with your depth of cut okay it's got to be able to keep up so 50 percent the diameter of the bit or less now um joe came back with eighth inch bit at 144 inch feed rate what is the depth of cut 16th of an inch or less 50 percent the diameter of the bit or less so for that i would probably be at a 0 0.04 or 0 0.05 depth of cut maybe up to the half you know 16th of an inch at 144 inches a minute generally my eighth inch bit is running around 55 inches a minute so if I was at a sixteenth of an inch pass step, if I'm running 144 inches a minute, I'm getting, something's going to get reduced. Whether it be my, of course my RPMs, but uh, my, my pass step's going to get reduced a little bit because uh, I want my bit to be able to keep up. 
and all that depends on the wood. If I'm carving in walnut, definitely going to increase the number of passes. If I'm cutting in pine, I might let it go and you know normal normal pass steps. Uh, if I'm cutting in purple heart, <laughs> you better believe I'm going to be taking 0 0.01, 0 0.02 depths of cut. Uh, if I'm cutting in aluminum, I'm going to be taking just maximum 30 thousandths of an inch depth of cut, 0 0.03. You know, so again, it has to do with the material that you're cutting in and stuff. So all of these things, you guys are going to, you know, uh, down the road, you could be happy with just saying, you know what, I'm just going to use the feed and speed chart that, uh, you know, that Laney provided in the Facebook group and leave it that. But that's just a recommendation, guys. That's not set in stone. You really want to start thinking about the more technical things. You really want to start thinking about the proper RPMs for your bit, uh, the proper feed rate and plunge rate, uh, your chip load and stuff, you know, getting that optimal cut. You really want to start thinking about that and you really want to start kind of going through your tool database and adjusting your tools appropriately. Set up those categories for pine wood purple heart and things like that or whatever and have all your tools under each of the categories with different settings that way when you click that tool for that wood then that's the tool you're using and all the settings are set that way you don't have to go through and do the math and change every single time you choose that bit you know set up the same bit 15 different times for 15 different species of material you know but they're going to have different feed rates and plunge rates and rpms you know based on that material and uh, populate that tool database. Fill it up. You can't fill it up. You can, you can add as many tools as you want to it. Um, so uh, the thing that you know you want you want to start you want to start. We're getting more and more. You know, even you new guys and girls that just got your machines. This might be whoa. Hold on. Wait a minute. I got to go through all this. No. Use your basic speed and feed chart that I provided in the digital wood carver owners group set your bits up to that and happy carving right but as you get more and more involved as you get more and more knowledgeable and more and more technical in your cuts and your your, your projects and things like that you really want to start getting more and more knowledge on your proper bit settings because we want to start extending the life of our bits and trying to get the most life out of that bit that we can and not build up a lot of heat on it and dull it quickly and things and so um, when you look at manufacturers uh, packaging and stuff they will tell you the maximum route RPM settings for that bit and that maximum RPM setting could be you know 10 to 20,000 RPMs. It could be, you know, 24,000 RPMs. It could be 15,000 RPMs, depending on the bit, um, you know, the diameter of the bit and things like that. Uh, the larger the diameter of the bit, the slower the RPMs. Um, if I'm running my inch and a quarter surface planing bit, I'm running that between 14 and 16,000 RPMs, you know. I'm taking 0 0.03 depth of cut, uh, you know, 30 thousandths of an inch depth of cut. I'm running around 75 to 80 inches a minute with it and all. And that's my settings. Doesn't have to be yours. You set up your tool database the way you want to. You know, do test cuts. Take notes. Log those notes down and then go in and set up your tool database. And um, start really now take it to the next level involved you know what I mean um, and I don't know if this information tonight uh, helped you gave you something to think about or confused you even more hopefully it gave you something to think about but um, I want you to uh, if you're looking for that feed and speed chart in the Digital Woodcarver Owners Group, it's called the Digital Woodcarver Feed and Speed Chart. Just a generic set of information for your bits and stuff. Um, and you in good all-around settings for just general stuff. But again, that's those settings are going to change based on your material. And of course, that chart, I'll provide that chart. That chip load chart is not something new. It's, just, it's the same chart. If you typed in chip load for wood, 
you'd find this chart in a lot of different pages and articles and things but this is a generic chart for standard wood uh, standard thickness of material with standard flute cutting it's gonna change dramatically based on the thickness of the material and the length of your cutting flute so this is just a reference chart it's not a Moses set in stone chart you know what I mean um, type of thing and I'll provide that I'll also you know make note and I'll provide a little sheet of how to determine you know what chip load you're getting you know for your bits how to determine what to set your feed rate at or your RPMs uh, these calculations and stuff for the you guys and girls that have the Hitachi I'll, I'll create a little sheet for your little what your number values are for those of you that have the Bosch and the Porter cable I'll look that up but it's also in your owner's manual that came with your box your router owner's manual uh, those will be in there um, and so yeah Howard a wall chart you know just a you know hell a dry erase board or just a chart hanging on the wall or a, you know piece of paper hanging on the wall with, with this information wonderful stuff to have uh, I have uh, my I have my decimal chart and my chip load chart taped to the side of my uh, on my uh, little work desk uh, uh, next to my laptop at my CNC I also have a um, my decimal chart and everything when I'm when I'm setting. If you if we take a moment here and switch back over to me for a moment, I also have my decimal chart and everything. Oops, my it's upside down. My decimal chart, uh, you know, by my computer here because I don't know all the decimals sometimes. And even though I can do math in the Vetric software. You know, these are nice little, these are notes. These are things that we have and stuff, you know, our, our charts. Uh, my chip load chart, as, as you see, it's image on my computer. Uh, so I can pull that up anytime I need to reference it. Um, I don't have a spreadsheet with my different bit settings and things like that in there. Uh, but it's a good idea if you want to make one, if you guys are into spreadsheets and all that stuff, make one you know uh, and all but I utilize the tool database for that um, that is my spreadsheet that, that keeps all my tools and stuff in there so um, a lot of things to just uh, keep in mind uh, Chuck asked a good question didn't mean to pause myself in there I was just getting into a rant but uh, Chuck asked a good question um, what is the first thing to notice about a bit getting dull? Uh, discoloration in the bit, uh, discoloration in your wood, fuzziness of the cut, you know. Um, and now I can't say fuzziness all the time because sometimes, depending on the wood, poplar is real fuzzy, uh, pine is real fuzzy, oak is real stringy and fuzzy. So I can't really say fuzziness of the wood. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you can tell when the bit is ripping through not cutting through you know where it's just just ripping through it you know um, but the first thing you notice is you start to get a little bit of discoloration in the tip of the bit uh, that means that bit is heated up so it's starting to get dull uh, then you when that discoloration is that bit gets duller now you're starting to burn your wood now you're getting burning in things you know so uh, discoloration of the bit is what I look at first uh, now Howard, uh, William, uh, before Chuck, asked the question, does producing chips affect the surface being carved? Yeah. Makes it a cleaner cut. Um, you get the nice, you get that nice sheer cut. When I say chips, you're not taking chunks, right? You're taking chips. And these chips range, you know, from three thousandths of an inch, a human hair, 0 0.003 in human hair you know a little bit bigger you know so three human hairs uh, you know uh, 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 five human hairs you know so these are small chips you know chips 
you know, and not chunks. So it creates a clean cut. When your bit is cutting at its optimal peak performance, getting a good chip load, not overheating, that heat is getting expelled and everything, your end result is going to be a good quality cut. No burning, nice clean surface cut, uh, you know, just nice clean cut. So, um, so yes, William, in a sense, that to answer the question, does producing chips affect the finished surface of the carve? Yes, it does. Uh, and William says, so optimal is to produce chips rather than dust, if nothing else, uh, for the life of bit. Yes, that is exactly what I'm saying. Your optimal cut is to produce chips, not dust. Chips, it's the heat. The heat is getting expelled away from the bit by those chips. That's it's going with those chips. You know, so the heat's getting just sheared away, sheared away, sheared away, keeping that bit nice and cool during that run. When you're making dust, there's nowhere for that heat to go. You're just making dust particles. That heat is staying around that bit. That bit's getting hot. Then it's starting to discolor, starting to dull. Your wood's starting to burn. You're tearing through the wood versus cutting it. You know, uh, it, it's, it starts that domino effect. So the optimal is to produce chips rather than dust. If not for anything, to extend the life of the bit. But also, also William, to add to that sentence, also to improve the quality of cut. Okay. All right. All right, guys and girls. I hope this class was informative. I don't want to go any further because it starts to become noise. I want you to be able to retain this little bit of information. Um, and not get too over confused because it was a confusing course. I hope you understood about how to choose the bit for the type of cut that you're wanting to do. Okay, I hope that you 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 got that. Um, when it comes to your, bear with me a second. Let me make sure I'm not dragging too far behind. Should catch up here. There we go. Um, uh, I get a little bit of a delay between our screens. Uh, I want to, I'll produce a little uh, cheat sheet for you for your, uh, if you want to make notes, you know, make notes. You can write this down, but I will post a nice organized looking cheat sheet in here for how to calculate your formulas and stuff. I will try to find the RPMs for the dials for the uh, Bosch and the Makita and the, and for the mini carvers, you know, the Makita, uh, the Bosch and the Porter cable. And I'll make note of those for you guys too. This is for the Hitachi router. Um, now, you guys and girls fortunate enough to have purchased a spindle, you control your RPMs. Your spindle range, of course, is from 0 to 24,000, you know, um, and uh, off to 24,000. And you control the RPMs of your spindle by the toolpath. This box here, you actually have to program in the appropriate RPMs because this toolpath is what, when you create that toolpath, this tool information here in that toolpath is what ramps your spindle up to that RPM. So you actually have to type in an accurate number in these boxes. But, um, you know, uh, I will so there's no you're not going to see a little cheat sheet with a range of your spindle speed of your uh, of your spindle because you set that spindle speed 10,000 15 11 5 2 4 you know whatever you know you set that uh, with your spindle you have a uh, more control okay um, and anyway I'll create this little cheat sheet uh, I will provide this little chip load chart uh, for you guys and girls, but please keep in mind that this is just a suggestion Okay Recommendation it's not set in stone and it does vary based on the thickness of the material This is average size material three-quarter inch to one inch thick Average size cutting flutes of your router, you know one inch, you know cutting length flutes or less You know it doesn't it changes, you know on longer flutes and 
thicker materials and things like that. So just use this as a suggestion, but don't say, oh, geez, man, if I, I'm, my bit says that I got to run 560 inches a minute and I can't get up that high, so I'm not getting the optimal, you know, read rate. So what do I do? What do I do? Don't, don't call me with those questions. This is just a suggestion. Get as close as you can. Set your RPMs appropriately. Get in a good range where you're making chips. Watch your cut. Look, look at the actual cut. Watch the chips you're producing. Are you producing more chips than dust? Heck, turn your dust collection off for a moment and just look. Look at the number of chips versus the amount of airborne dust that you're getting. You know, you want that ratio to be larger, you know, more chips than dust and stuff. And, uh, but I don't want you panicking saying, oh my gosh, I can't get to this in this setting. It's not, you know, my router won't go that fast or, or it won't go that high or what have you. Don't, don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to me. I don't want those phone calls because it's just a suggestion you want to just make chips. You, you visually watch your cut. Do some test cuts. Look at the cut. You want to see chips coming out of there. Not big chunks. Nice chips. Human hair size or larger. Nice little chips. <laughs> All right. Now, um, William says, can you go from Planet CNC TNG, the 1030 to the 626? Absolutely. Uh, here's what you got to keep in mind, William. You're going to need the new uh, post processors. They are in They are in the Facebook owners group. They did the Vetric post processors, uh, digital wood carver inch tap, DWC millimeter tap, and DWC laser tap. You will need to import those into your Vetric software when you switch over to the 626 of the TNG because that new version requires requires the M5 code that tells the machine to turn the router off, that tells the program to turn the router off. It needs that M5 code in the G code. And if you don't have the correct post processor, and save your toolpath with that new updated post processor, then your router will not shut off at the end of the job. You'll have to manually shut it off unless you go through and physically add the M5 code in at the end of the job. So I can talk to you one-on-one -on -one about that. You can call me, I can help you set up, but yes, you can go to 626. You just gotta update your post processors in your Vetric software if you're jumping from 1030 to 626, okay? Okay. 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 All right. I'm glad you guys uh, thought this class was informative. Uh, Howard, dust uh, is not uh, too fast or bit dull. Dust means that your feed rate might be a little fast. Yep. Your RPMs could be a little high okay um the feed rate could be a little fast and your rpms could be a little high your feed rate could be a little slow and your rpms be a little high you know whatever the case may be um uh when you're producing dust uh you're going too fast you know generally on the rpms that bit spinning too fast and it's making dust it's not making nice chips you want to slow those rpms down and adjust the feed rate appropriately based on that little chart uh, now, dullness, dull bit, Howard, that means that heat is building up, which essentially means that you're making dust. So the statement that you just asked is basically the same, it says the same thing. Um, so when you say dust is too fast and or dull bit, no, dust leads to dull bit. And dust means you're going too fast or, or your RPMs are too high. So you gotta adjust them accordingly. And those, you know, if you're not doing that optimal chip, you know, your 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 heat heat's building up on that bit and you're dulling it much quicker than it should. You know, bits should last a long time. Uh, you know, depending on the material you're cutting and stuff. And if we if we get close to the right settings, uh, we can extend that life of that bit tremendously. You know. So 
Howard, you were right in your statement except for the and or. Um, dust leads to dull bit. Okay. Uh, yeah. Number six all the time, Howard. That, you know, 24,500 RPMs. That's what, you know, that's based on what I've told you guys. You know, just keep it at number six and, you know, run 55 inches, 35 inches, 25. You know, the bit settings that I said is a good generic all around, no matter what material you're carving in. And that's good generic settings. Nothing wrong with them. But we got to start now thinking more technical. We got to start thinking about extending the wear and tear, the life of our bit, getting the optimal cut that we can get, uh, you know, quality of cut. Uh, less heat means less burning of our material and things like that. So we, now we got to start getting a little more technical. And I'm going to start getting technical with you guys in some things. Uh, and this is just the first part. So the basics of this was the first part, how to choose the right bit for the job, right? How to choose the right bit for the job. The step up technical part is, okay, how do we set and figure out the feed rate and the RPMs of our router for that bit? So a little bit technical, a little bit step up, something you guys haven't done up to now. Some of you may have, you know, some of you may already know this stuff, but we're going to start looking at that more in depth and stuff and all. So I hope, uh, I hope this was uh, helpful. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's 945. If there are no other questions, if there's any questions, uh, ask them now. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i go for another five minutes uh, and then we're gonna call it a night. So if you have any last minute questions, uh, speak now or hold your peace till next Monday. <laughs> uh, but in the next five minutes, we are going to say our goodbyes to one another. And uh, all right, I don't see any questions popping up, so I'm assuming everyone's done for the evening. Um, unless y'all are still typing, I'm gonna give you another minute. <laughs> hit enter and finish typing. Your, you can type it in the second part, uh, but hit enter just so if, if you are in the middle of a question, let's kind of get it started. Um, because it'll be nothing but dead air. Uh, Howard, uh, email me at sales at digitalwoodcarver.com and uh, let me know what stuff that is. Uh, uh, you're gonna have to refresh my memory on that, on that, uh, and I can check with the uh, shop. Uh, but sales at digitalwoodcarver.com. Email me on that and uh, refresh my memory and let me research with uh, Burl and them to see if anything got shipped out. You're welcome. Rochelle, uh, whether it answered your question or not, let me just uh, say this to you. Um, when you're looking at your router bit, when you're looking at your router bit, bear with me a second while I uh, do this. Uh, let's see here. What would be the best way to draw this out? Give me a second. Give me a second. Gonna be the ugliest uh, router bit you ever seen. All right, not the best looking spiral bit, but you generally want to look at the gullets, uh, which is the you know the end cut of the cutter, and that will tell you how many flutes there are. 
So this would be a rough drawing, not exactly to scale. This would be a rough drawing of a two flute spiral bit, okay? Um, if it were a straight bit, uh, you would generally see two carbide cutters you know that come out like if I was looking at the end of the bit you generally see two carbide cutters and again that's a two flute straight bit uh, a four flute uh, would have four gullets uh, so let's see if I can Uh, control. All right, well, here's an example of a three flute cutter. <laughs> I didn't draw a four flute, but uh, three flute cutter. Um, you, if you look at the end of the bit, just look at the gullets, that's the openings. And that'll tell you how many flutes. The flute is the actual blade. So one, two, three. All right. So look at the bottom view. Yep, from the bottom. Look at the bottom of the bit. Bottom view. And so you would, uh, you know, generally see that, you know, those uh, cutters and all. All right. All right. Okay, guys and girls. Um, Y'all have a wonderful night. Thank you for spending this time with me. I hope this class was informative. And until Monday next week, I'll see you soon.